so glad to have you all here tonight. Welcome. Welcome to the Healing Power of Plant Foods cooking class. I'm April and over here in the kitchen with me is Jan and we're super excited to have you here with us tonight. So um, I know Karen's new. You guys have seen before. You've been here before and I know Christine's been here. You've been here too, right? No? Welcome. It's great to have you. So happy to have you guys. Um, I've got one more coming, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, there truly is healing power in plant foods. And I'm super excited. I love to teach people about food and health and how you can get healthier, even reverse some diseases and help you to lose weight and just to feel better, boost your immune system, give you more energy and just help you to feel really good. And I love to teach people about that. I um, discovered back in, I don't know, 1991, the healing power of plant foods and how great they are for your body and how they can help you, like I say, help you to lose weight and all that stuff and just to get healthier. And I, I come from a standard American family, grew up eating the standard American diet, and I've seen all my family members get the standard American diseases, heart disease, diabetes, both my parents died of cancer, and I decided a long time ago that I wanted to do something different. And so I just through a little searching and reading and learning about diet and health, I discovered a plant-based diet and switched pretty much 100% overnight. Within a week, uh, I felt so much better. My energy skyrocketed, my weight kind of leveled out. I wasn't worried so much about that. And I just felt really good. So, but my, my message isn't necessarily, you gotta go 100% plant-based, that's all there is to it. Um, my message is more, you gotta eat more. More whole foods, more uh, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, just more of these delicious whole natural plant foods and try to eat them in the way that nature has provided for it, provided them as close, as close to nature as you can. And that's what I do. We don't want to, we don't want to dread, we don't want to not enjoy cooking and eating because we have to eat these vegetables that taste so horrible. We want to learn to love vegetables and incorporate them into your diet plan to make them so that they're tasty and delicious. And that's, that's my job. I love to, love to create recipes and make food that tastes good and especially love to feed other people and teach other people. So thank you for being here and let me live my passion. <laughs> so um, I love questions. So if you have any questions as we go along, has everybody got recipes for over there? And I do have a list up here. Has everybody initialed it? Looks like there's a couple that haven't. Did you guys initial this? Oh, Christina, you haven't. There's a couple spots there. Did you guys initial? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm Jackie. You're Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, we have. Uh, thank you. And, yeah. Okay. All right. We're our shows. We're still missing some, but I mean, I've got, I got five here and four names. Oh no, we don't. We got right there. Sorry, I missed that. We'll just put that back here. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started. We've got a fall menu tonight. I'm doing autumn stew and a fruity fall cabbage salad, and a greens and grains, simple greens and grains, and a spice cake with a pear compote on top. I like to use that in place of frosting, although I do have a pretty good frosting recipe, but um, this is just a little bit healthier, and we're in fall, and I love, I love kind of cooking for the seasons, love using the, the fall foods, and although I'm not very excited about fall, because with fall comes winter, and with winter comes cold. <laughs> and I don't like that very much. So we've got our sixth person. I'm going to have you initial right here. Good. Thank you for coming. All right. So, oh, you know what? We're going to start over here with the cake because we want to get that in the oven and get it cooked and somewhat cooled before we serve it. So I like to use all whole foods as much as possible. So when you make a cake, you've got your flour and your sugar and your butter or oil or whatever it is. I'm using the same kind of ingredients, but all in whole food forms. I'm using um, my grain is rolled oats and we are gonna grind it down. My fats are whole pecans. And then I've got um, my sweetener, which is dates. Dates is one of my favorite ways to sweeten. Sweeten desserts, it's a whole food. All the parts of the plant are still there and they, they work great. So I'm gonna, um, I'm, we're just gonna do this spice cake. 
and it, it's good to have a food processor. In fact, it's, it's pretty much necessary. Or a good blender would possibly work. You might have to do things in batches. But we are going to just put our oats. We've got a cup and a half of rolled oats. We're just going to put them in here in the food processor. And then I'm going to grind down also my nuts. I've got three-fourths cups of nuts. Pecans. You could use walnuts as well. Oops, that goes back there. And um, let's see, we are going to put in our spices and we've got, that's my salad spices. I got to keep things straight or I'll be in trouble. And we've got cinnamon. You know what? I don't have the spice cake recipe on the back. Anyway, we've got our spices, cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, and we've got some baking soda in here. And is that it? I, oh, dash of cloves. Thank you. I don't love cloves. I like just a dash, mm -hmm. and a dash is like like sixteenth of a teaspoon. So, um, you know, if you like a little bit more of that, that's great. And I'm going to go ahead and and my baking soda is in there as well. I'm going to go ahead and just grind all this up and make it kind of a fine uh, flour consistency. And then we're going to add our sweetener, which is dates. And I've, I've got these dates soaking in three-fourths cup of water, I believe. And the reason I do that is to soften them up. And we want the moisture in here anyway. But when you soak your dates in here, it's going to soften them up and make them grind down much, much easier. In fact, if you put these in a blender, you'd get like a sauce, like a date, date paste. Well, you can make date paste. That's pretty popular in dessert recipes. Date yeah, date or date butter. So, um, and they are pitted dates. These are the Diglett Noor pitted dates that you can buy at Costco in the tub. I don't know if you're familiar with dates in Costco, but Costco's got some that are in a little square container in the produce section, and then they've got a round container in the dried fruit section, and that's what these are. They're a little bit less money per pound, and they're just better for this type of thing. So I'm gonna go ahead and add those dates with that water. And then we're gonna add some apple cider vinegar and the apple cider vinegar mixed with the baking soda is gonna kinda help these rise a little bit. And then we're gonna put in some molasses and this is a tablespoon of molasses. That's always a really nice addition. You could use maple syrup if you're not fond of the molasses but I think it's, it's really good to have that with the spice, if you're doing a spice cake, kind of a gingery spice cake. No, <laughs> uh, no, it's it comes from the the processing of sugar, and it's actually the healthiest part. And they basically throw that away when they're processing sugar. I mean, they don't throw it away; they make molasses with it. But, um, but um, it is a healthy er sweetener. Any processed sugars aren't great, but this is how I use processed sweeteners. Like I will use a little bit of maple syrup if I want kind of a mapley flavor. I've got a barbecue sauce that I want a little mapley flavor and so I'll put in a tablespoon or two of, of it. Actually, I think that recipe makes a lot, so I put in about a quarter cup. But the base of all my sweetening is always like the whole food sweeteners and then this is just mainly for flavor, which is fine. All right, and then I believe that's all. We'll just go ahead and grind this up and we want a kind of, we're gonna, we want a dough consistency and this is gonna be way thicker uh, vanilla, thank you. I'm always forgetting the vanilla. I don't know that poor vanilla. It always gets forgotten. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You guys got to keep an eye on me because I'll forget things or get things mixed up or something. Okay, we're just going to grind this all up, and we want we want a dough like consistency, and it's going to be relatively thick. It's hard to make. Um, this is it's going to be thick, and it's also going to be a real dense cake. I mean, this is all because of the dates and the nuts. This is almost like a candy bar, kind of. It's, it's very rich. And you can actually make cookies with this. Spice cake cookies, just get a cookie scoop and put them out on a cookie sheet, and they'll bake up really nice and puffy, kind of like a cake. Spice cake cookies is what I call them.
and we don't want to process that too much so it doesn't get sticky. Let's go one more round. Okay. And then we're going to take our pan here. I've got an 8 by 8 cake pan. And you can double this recipe probably fairly easy. I haven't done it. Um, if you've got a good, strong food processor. If you don't, you wouldn't want to double it. You could make two batches if you wanted to make a bigger cake and then put it in a bigger pan, of course. But this is, like I say, it's pretty dense and pretty rich. So a little goes a long way. Although I have no problem eating <laughs> a quarter of it, you know. <laughs> so. So we're just going to, and I've got parchment paper in the bottom of my pan. I love using parchment paper. It makes things so clean and just comes out really nice. And sometimes I will uh, let this cake cool, invert it onto a platter, and then I do the, the pear compote. Or actually, I, when I first came up with doing a fruit as the topping, I was doing peaches. And that was really good. But I decided for fall that we'd try pear, and that works really nice as well. So I am going to spin this again. So I'll take that lid back just to clean off the, the gunk from the blades. And then I like to put this back on here and just spin it and get the, get the dough off those blades. And then that just makes it easy to clean off. And I won't be using this again, so you can, you can wash that up. My favorite vegetable, probably kale. I eat it every day. Um, oh, that's too bad. Yeah, probably that was probably the best way to go. It might be. Yeah, who knows what it is? That's interesting. Do you have any other? Huh, that's interesting. Do you eat it raw or cooked or both? Oh, raw? You might want to try it uh, cooked too. There's no other one type of variety. I mean, oh, find one good idea. Good idea. Yeah, yeah, it's good for you. According to Dr. Furman, um, who is a family physician that I followed for years, for those who don't know him. Um, he wrote lots of books and does the nutritarian way. He, on his antioxidant um, antioxidant list, can't remember what it's called, nutrient density list. Uh, kale is number one. It's like a thousand up there with collard greens as well. Actually, I think collard greens are a little bit lower, but I love it. I don't know. I. I I do like it raw and have used it raw, and use, I, I use it raw pretty much exclusively right now, but I do love it steamed. Steamed with a little bit of avocado mixed into it, which sounds really odd, but it's so good. Avocado or some ground up seeds. We're going to kind of do a greens and grains dish tonight that I think you'll really like. It's just a basic. Okay, so this is your spice cake, and we will put that in the oven at 350 degrees for... Huh. Somebody tell me how 17, long. I think it's 17, 17 minutes? I should know. This is the second time I've made it. Let's see. Kitchen timer. 17. 17 minutes. There we go. All right. Let's move over to our soup and get that going. Autumn stew. I love this autumn stew. It's one of those dishes you can make for your normal family members. You know what I'm saying when I say normal family members? <laughs> and, uh, and they like it. So let me get this dough off my glove. Okay. We'll get our burner going here. So I'm going to start off with a yellow onion, which is how I start most of my dishes. And when you 
get these onions and smell them. There's no hard chemical smells that make your eyes water. It doesn't happen until you cut them, right? And those are organosulfur compounds. And those are powerful against cancer. Um, people, a study out of uh, um, Europe with 10 countries showed that people who ate the most onions had the least cancers of all type. Um, Dr. Michael Greger is a um, medical doctor that I follow a lot. He, or I used to, not so much anymore. He has a website called nutritionfacts.org and it's listed on the back of your paper underneath homework. You guys have homework, by the way. <laughs> and um, he's, he's one of my favorites and he um, puts out videos all the time about the different research that comes out about, about different foods. And this is one of them that he talks about onions and he also talks about other foods. I'm not going to use that anymore. So, in okay. fact, if you'll switch that with my blender, you bet. put my blender right there. Um, he talks about different foods and how they how they react against cancer and how they attack cancer cells and all that stuff. And certain foods are good for certain types of cancer. Well, onions, garlic, scallions, leeks, all the allium vegetables work across the board for all different types all, all different types of cancers. So we want to get onions in on a regular basis. They have powerful anti-inflammatory pro um, properties as well. They show to de uh, detoxify carcinogens. Stopping. Um, you know, raw is better. Raw is going to have more powerful effect. But the cook is good too. The key is, and we never cook an onion whole, of course. At least I had never have, other than maybe roasting it in an oven. But the key is chopping of it. So we're, we're chopping of it, chopping the onion. You're breaking open the cell walls and you're making those micronutrients much more bioavailable and they start to work together. Like you've got different compounds in different parts of the cell and when you chop, chopping all that, you're releasing those compounds and they're kind of coming together in like a symphony and they're creating something really wonderful. So we want to chop them up really fine. Um, you know what, what's recommended, I think Dr. Furman recommends it or somebody recommends that you, if you're putting raw, uh, cooked onion in a soup, because you lose some of those compounds, but some of them stay. And so if you put them in a soup and then top your soup with some scallions or something like that, you're bringing back in that, that compound that's lost. So we're going to go ahead and dump our onion in our pan. I have nothing in my pan. I don't saute with anything. I saute with a dry, a dry pan. And that is because um, we don't want to use oil. Oil is 120 calories of pure fat. I need a wood spoon. Can you find me a wood spoon? Um, it's the highest calorie, lowest, nutri lowest nutrient food that we consume, and it increases inflammation in the body, increases risk of heart disease. Now, if we're eating a very high fat Western diet with, um, you know, lots of dairy and, and butter and those kind of things and you switch to using olive oil. Thank you. Oh, this is fine. This is usually what I use. Um, you're going to get, you're going to get benefits. Definitely. But, uh, it still causes that inflammation. Olive oil has been shown to slow blood flow 40% within four months, within four hours, four months, within four hours of consumption. Um, and I, I invite you to go on to, you can just go on to YouTube, but it might be easier just to go on to my website, healthforlooking.com, and write, I have a whole bunch of videos. I love listening to nutrition lectures and videos, but down a little ways, it says, why no oil? I've got four doctors that talk about why, and the, the main guy is Dr. Caldwell Esselstein. He's the director of Pre preventive cardiolo cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic, and he has a a 91, I believe, percent success rate with reversing heart disease in his patients, severe heart disease. I mean, they're, they're ready for bypass surgery and they want to go the food route whether, rather than the, the cut your chest open and move arteries around route <laughs> and medication route. And so, and they do it. Um, like I said, 90, I think it's like 98% success rate when they follow his protocol and he says absolutely no oil no olive oil no canola oil no safflower oil no motor oil <laughs> no oil at all and he even takes the nuts and seeds and avocados out for these severe patients he says once you get healthy and your arteries are cleared out then you can add those things back in safely but you want to get those things out now there is a, there is some controversy on that a little bit but if i if that if i was that if i was the k had that situation i would definitely go full bore because i'm 
I'm pretty, I'm kind of a little bit too radical that way. I'm, I'm okay with radical, I guess you could say. Because I don't want, my, my dad had a, heart, had, a heart, had a heart attack. In fact, my uncle had a heart attack. In fact, everybody in my family, not everybody in my family, my grandparents, and did the bypass surgery. And I just, that just scares me to death. I don't even want to go there. So, see, I still haven't, I don't know, can you guys see the, the burner on there? Um, it's not browning. Uh, this is a fairly decent pan, good stainless steel pan, which, is, which helps. And it is starting to brown just a little bit, and that's okay. We just want to saute that until it starts to get a little translucent. Um, the, the browning is the caramel, caramelization of the onions on the bottom of the pan. The sugar's coming out. Um, while we're waiting here, I'm going to go ahead and chop these mushrooms because we're going to add those. And if you guys aren't familiar with the Vidalia Chop Wizard, I think most of you are, unless you haven't been here before. Have you been in my classes? No, you haven't. Okay, well, welcome. <laughs> oh, you do have a chopper? Awesome. Do you love it? Yeah. <laughs> I actually, yeah. Yeah. I use it for, I'll, I'll demonstrate broccoli in a little bit, but I, I, have, I do use it for tomatoes. You got to be really careful. Because they will splatter. You got to be really fast. Oh, I use the, the large one. Yeah, I'm using the large one. And you can just slice your, your mushrooms if you want. But, um, and we want like two cups, so we'll just stop there. What's that? Oh, oh, there goes my burning. We got there going on a little bit too much burning going on there. I'm going to add some water. And that browning just comes right up pretty easily if I don't let it go too long. That's what happens when I go and do something else. I get sidetracked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, one thing at a time. I've burned too many pans, although they seem to clean up pretty good. <laughs> okay, and then I'm going to add my garlic, and I've got four cloves of uh, chopped garlic, minced garlic. And garlic, again, it's from that allium family of vegetables, powerful against cancer. We want to use garlic on a regular basis. So um, let's see. And then we're going to go ahead and add, we're going to go ahead and add our, um, these mushrooms. Mushrooms are powerful against cancer as well. Um, they have, they have an estrogen blocker that keeps estrogen levels low and estrogen spurs cancer growth. Uh, some studies out of China showed that just one button mushroom a day, and that's, these, that's what these are, button mushrooms. One button mushroom a day decreased risk of breast cancer in women uh, 64%. And when they were drinking green tea as well, it bumped it up to 89%. We want to get those mushrooms in. They have um, angiogenesis inhibitors, or anti-angiogenic, which means that they stop tumors from spreading to other parts of the body. In fact, I heard an interview um, back to the estrogen, or the estrogen blocker, I heard, heard an interview online. It had nothing to do with nu nutrition. I can't remember. It was like mental health or something like that. She was talking about her, deal, her, her, ep her, her experience going through cancer and chemo and all the, you know, the treatments and stuff and was saying that her doctor had, on an, had her on an estrogen blocker. And I was like, mushrooms! I just wanted to scream, mushrooms! <laughs> I write a little note underneath the, underneath the video. You should try mushrooms. Anyway, um, so yeah, estrogen blocker, mushrooms. Um, they help to stimulate immune function. They contain 22 proteins that lower cholesterol and blood pressure at the same time. Great way to feed your gut. Your gut microbiome really likes mushrooms because they have some good probiotics in them. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and chop our kale. And I really love the curly leaf kale. It's my favorite, but Smith's curly leaf didn't look so good tonight so and I should have just gone to Harmon's because they're so much better with their kale but um, this looked actually really nice and I don't mind using when I'm cooking it in a soup or something I don't mind the lacinato this is a lacinato kale it's more of a flat leaf kale and um, the curly leaf is of course more curly and a little bit harder to cut this is a little bit more easy to easy to control when you're cutting so we're just going to chop this up and uh, kale is a cruciferous vegetable. If I didn't me mention that, 
Cruciferous vegetables include kale and collards, broccoli, cabbage, bok choy, Brussels sprouts, um, cauliflower, arugula, watercress, um, beets. In fact, have you ever cooked beet greens? Don't throw your beet greens out. Cook them. They're so good. I couldn't believe it. I was, I grew, we grow beet, or not beets. I mean, I mean, well, beets, beet greens are good too. Um, radish greens is what I'm talking about. Radish is a cruciferous vegetable. And I always throw their greens out and I thought, I wonder how these would be cooked. And I cooked them and they were so good. So yeah, don't throw those out. Anyway, they're part of, and turnips are also cruciferous as well, and cruciferous vegetables have the most powerful effect against cancer. They increase the liver to, liver's ability to remove toxins out of the body before cell damage can even occur, which is where cancer comes from. It's from cell damage, when, when cells get damaged from environmental toxins, um, pollutants around us, uh, you know, basically exercise and basic metabolism, you know, uh, Produces an, an, or produces oxidation in your body, which is damage to the cell. So we need to eat lots of antioxidants to protect our cells. Um, women who eat a cup of kale a day showed to have half the risk of breast cancer. Um, actually, uh, a cup of cruciferous vegetables in general, not just kale. And men, by the way, three servings a week showed a, uh, let's see, 41% less risk of prostate cancer. So, and I don't know if that's raw or cooked. Raw, of course, is better. Your raw, your raw vegetables are going to be your best bet. But again, the same thing applies with, with greens, cruciferous bean, greens as, as the onion. When you chop it up, you're breaking open the cell wall and making those micronutrients very bioavailable, bio but we're going to throw that in with our soup. Um, but when you cook it, you're destroying one, and I'm sure others, one of the, one of the nutrients that has got those powerful anti-cancer anti properties. So what all you have to do is bring in some raw when you're having a, have a raw cabbage salad with this soup, which we're doing tonight. I didn't even think about that before. That wasn't even planned. <laughs> All right. And we'll just give that a little stir. And then we're going to put in some red bell pepper. And I'll go, go ahead and chop that with our chopper. I didn't even notice if that was two cups of kale. By the time my cup, by the, by the way, my, my cups are like my handful. Like if it's two handfuls of greens, I don't try to measure it. And really, you could put in, I mean, if I was doing this at home for myself, and that's not a whole lot more actually, I would probably just put in the whole bunch just because I really like kale. And you want to make sure you get that diced up really small because I don't like to be eating a soup and take a spoonful and have a string of green. I mean, I, I like it, but I, I think most people would not. You want to, you know, for your general population people, you want to chop things up really fine. So we're doing a red bell pepper. And that is a beautiful red bell pepper. That came from the farmer's market. They were a little bit small, but the farmer's market in downtown on Saturdays, they have a gal. It's like the first year I've seen her there with produce. She usually has honey, but she had these beautiful looking red bell peppers. She said no spray, so... That's always a plus, because red bell peppers are one of the dirty dozen, if you're familiar with the dirty dozen. And the clean 15 dirty dozen is the most highly uh, pesticide residue vegetables. Clean 15 are the least. So if they, the environmental working group, which is ewg.org, they say if you stick to the clean 15 and stay away from the dirty dozen and just eat organic with that, then your pesticide exposure is much better, much, much less. Okay, we are going to, let's see, let's make sure I've got, I'm just doing the onion, garlic, bell pepper, mushrooms, and broth. We're gonna put in just a little bit more broth. So I, I do soups a little bit different. You could just put everything in this pot and cook it until everything's done. The problem with that is butternut squash takes a little time to cook. As you know, and you know it's so dense in a soup. It'd take probably at least an hour for this soup to cook. 
And I can pretty, cook it pretty quick by just doing it this way and having the butternut squash already cooked. So what I've done is all I do, and it's super, super easy. You don't even have to cut it or anything. Who has cut a butternut squash before? Did you lose any fingers while you did it? <laughs> um, so you just take your squash, put it on a cookie sheet, put it in the oven, turn on the oven, that's it, okay? You cook it for, a lot of times if I'm gonna be home, I'll cook it at a low, lower temperature just because in my head that's better. I don't know if it really is, but I just like cooking at lower temperatures. And um, so I'll cook it for 350 for like an hour and a half to two hours. And what I do is halfway through, or when it's starting to get a little bit soft, I'll pull it out. And it's a little bit hard to handle because it's hot, but I'm just really careful. I'll cut off the end because it cuts off really easy because it's a little bit cooked. I'll tip it up and then, and then I'll cut it down. And it's still a little bit raw, so it's, you know, but it's just much easier to cut that way. And then I put it on my cookie sheet again, face down, and continue to cook it. That way it's just so much easier. And then um, you're not peeling it when it's raw as well. Peeling your butternut squash is a little bit difficult. Um, and when it comes out of the oven and, and cools, the skin is probably not going to come off as easy this time. The last one I did was really good, but the, the, the um, oh, there you go. The skin just comes off really easy. You're not wasting any of the flesh that sticks to the skin when you just cut it. Not that you're wasting a whole lot. If you cut it with a vegetable peeler, it's usually pretty, pretty good. I think we're... Um Oh, I guess we are done. I thought we had six minutes left, but that's the time. 6.36. Will you grab that, grab that out of there? I think, let me just peek at it, make sure it's, it should be good. It should be good and cooked, I guess. Yeah, it is. You know what? Actually, 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 let's, let's let that go a little bit more. Let's go let that go another two, like another three minutes. 17 to, to 20 minutes. Got a timer for three minutes. What is happening? It's just the, uh, it's just the, um, what do you call it? Timer. Yeah, the timer. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to kind of just, some of this isn't quite coming off. Oh, and by the way, the bowl of the, of the squash, it gets really soft after it's done cooking and this part is soft enough, it's super soft and will just fall apart in the soup, which is fine, but I like to just eat that. In fact, I have a, I have a hard time with butternut squash because I love it so much. If it's a good sweet one, I pull that out of the oven, I just want to get a fork and just eat it the way it is because it's so good. And then I'm going to just, um, just kind of cut this like this and it's super, so much easier. What's that? Oh, oh, yeah, oh so you got to get used to the, the delicious flavors of just the food the way it came. It's funny how your taste buds really adjust, like when you kind of get away from that kind of stuff, you know, like heavier foods. It's, yeah, oh, it is, isn't it such a habit? Yep, I get that for sure. We kind of do things the way mom did things, you know, or grandma or whatever, like kind of the whole squash thing. I mean, they cut, cut the squash in half and dig out the seeds and put it on a cookie sheet with water in the bottom of it, with water in the pan, you know. And I was like, why do you have to do that? I'm just going to, I'm kind of a lazy cook. I want to just make it quick. Oh, that's, that's right. I remember you saying that. That probably works really well as well. Oh, of course. Those Instapots. I don't have one. I'm not sure what I'd do with it if I did have one because <laughs> I've been cooking this way for so long. I'm sure I would learn to like it. I have a crock pot though, so like maybe when that goes bad, I'll, when that dies, I'll get, get an Instapot. Okay, I'm not gonna add that quite yet because we're, we're gonna wait until, what I like to do, so I was talking about soups, doing this ahead of time so you don't have to, so you don't have to um, cook it so long. And so what I do is I just cook these vegetables right here until the kale gets tender and then I add everything else and it's done just within, uh, just enough to warm it, warm it through. And I can tell that kale is still not. Oh, what's that? I haven't, I haven't put any of my seasonings in. I usually put that more towards the end of cooking. Yeah, unless it's something like rosemary, which I'm doing in this other dish. So in fact, we will jump over to that right now. Or um, 
Yeah, we'll jump over to the to the rice right now. So if you want to go ahead and do, um, I'm going to cook. I'm actually going to cook these three mm -hmm. for the compote. So if you want to just chop them with that, and then we'll put them. I'm at. They didn't have any smaller pans, so it's just going to have to go in there. Oh, okay. So. We didn't, did you bring your uh, cleaner for your? Potato? No, of course not. <laughs> Don't worry about. I have a little pepper in. I'll clean. Hair. Oh, that's true. I'll clean it when I get home. But yeah, that's, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. There's a little cleaner that comes with the chopper, and I, I don't want to lose them, so I don't bring them. I just clean it when I get home. But anyway, my, I ask her every time. We, I know. I have like, I only have like five or six yeah. of them. I need to bring it. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move over here to our other pan. And I think I got the wrong. Yes, I did. And this is Teflon. I normally don't use Teflon, but I don't want to bring all my pans to my class. So I do, I do like to bring my stainless steel one just to show, um, oh, just to show uh, how I can saute without oil and stuff. Um, I'm actually going to need that chopper, so I'll probably okay. have you oh, wait. Oh, did I put it in the water? Yeah, Shoot. that's okay. That's okay. Actually, you know what? I don't need it. You sure? Yeah. You guys are familiar with the chopper. You guys have seen the chopper. You've all known the chopper. Okay, I was just going to... You can get it online. You used to be able to get it at Bed Bath & Beyond, but that's, um, that's no longer. So I'm going to put the... Um, let's see. I'm going to put that squash in here so I can use that cutting board. Okay, so we're gonna just do some uh, another, another some more onion here, and I'll just chop it by hand as well. So I like to do I I in my classes I usually do kind of a, a main dish that might be a little bit more. Although this soup is really easy to put together, it doesn't really take much time at all if you've got that butternut squash already cooked. And I was just I was just talking about that. Um, I, what's your What's your name on the end here? I was just talking about the butternut squash and how I cook it ahead of time, and that way the the soup can cook a lot quicker, and because it's already cooked, the butternut squash is already cooked. So, um, and I just cook that in the oven till it's soft. So we're gonna go ahead and just chop up this onion. Oh, I started to say. So I usually do. I like to do you know, maybe a recipe that takes a little bit more time, and then I like to show a really simple, easy recipe, and this is this one that I'm doing right here. Super quick, super easy, just real basic. It's just got some nice flavor, though, and I eat greens and grains a lot these days. And again, we're just going to, how many greens a day? Oh, grains. I usually have maybe a half to three quarters cup of oat groats in the morning along with a smoothie. And then I have about a cup of a combination grain. Uh, it's uh, quinoa, millet, buckwheat, and sorghum for my lunch. And I just make a big pot of it. I always have rice cooked and I always have this grain combination cooked. And I, the reason I do the combination is because you're getting different fibers. I've got some food sensitivities. I'm trying to get my gut working better. And so I'm, I'm focusing on getting some good grains. And those are just a really great grain combination. And so, um, yeah, I have that. I have a cup of that in my, in, my in my lunch with my salad, in my salad. And then for dinner, I have about a cup and a half with my whatever it is I'm having, which is usually some kind of greens and grains dish. All right, and then we're gonna go ahead and add some garlic. We've got a clove, a nice clove of garlic. And of course, the garlic, you can put as much or as little as you want, but you wanna get a little bit, little, little garlic at least. 
And we're also going to put in our rosemary, teaspoon of rosemary. Now these greens and grains, I do a lot of different greens and grains dishes. I'll do Mexican greens and grains, I'll do Italian greens and grains, I'll do greens and grains pilaf, like a rice pilaf that I put, I put actually chopped broccoli in it. And so instead, I think I put on your recipes the way I do the Mexican ones. I just, instead of the rosemary, I'll just do the garlic and onion. And then I'll do some chopped kale or chopped broccoli. And then I'll put in some cumin and chili powder and your Mexican seasonings. And then I'll stir in my rice or I'll put in, did I say greens? Some kind of greens. And then I'll stir in my rice and some tomato sauce. And you can put some beans in there as well. And just make a really great kind of taco meat to put in with a salad or roll in a tortilla. Really super, super good. All right, and now we are going to, that right there. We're gonna throw in our broccoli and I've chopped the broccoli with the large blade of the, of the chopper. I was gonna do it, the rest with this, but, but I'll, just, I'll just do it the old fashioned way <laughs> and use a knife. The chopper works really great for the broccoli. Although it's, broccoli is a little bit sticky. That, those florets, the, the, the leaves, just make it a little bit sticky. So um, you have to, sometimes it's a little bit, the chopper is a little bit temperamental. You gotta work with it a little bit. I use the, the larger, yep, the larger. Although I used to use, I have an enchilada casserole that I put broccoli in, and I used to use the, the small one. And you know, then you can't even, you can't even see them see the broccoli in it, which is, which is what you want. When you're doing an enchilada casserole and you're putting broccoli in it, you don't want people to see it. Jay calls that hide a vegetable. Hide a vegetable, there you go. <laughs> and it's kind of the same, I mean, this, this dish right here that I'm doing is kind of, you know, it's some, some, it, the class that I did this last Thursday, she said, I love how the, the broccoli's chopped so fine because um, then you really don't, you don't notice it as much. I mean, this is a rice dish, and so you do see it, but it's not like big chunks, if you don't like big chunks. And I'm fine with big chunks of broccoli, but. Broccoli is my favorite Is it? I love I, lo I love steamed broccoli. I don't like it raw very well. Yeah, it's just very, it's very, like, very raw. <laughs> For lack of better words, it's just so raw. And I, li I love raw greens, but that's about it. Uh -huh. Oh, shoot. Yeah, it can smell bad for sure. So I'm just adding more water to my soup pot. The kale looks like it is probably pretty tender. So we are going to just figure it is. I'll add a little bit more water to this. Yes, please. And those are just three of them, right? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I'm just having Jan chop the, the pear for the compote with the small blade of the chopper. And we're just gonna, we're just gonna cook that, cook those pears. The peach that I did, um, is that not all of them you said? No. Okay. The peach that I did, I, I, st I kept raw and would blend it and make a sauce. And then I would add it to the, the sliced peaches, which is so good. With, I, I actually blended the peaches with some dates to make it extra sweet poured that over the chopped peaches. But I find pears are so sweet. When you cook pears, oh my gosh, they're so great. Although peaches would be probably sweeter cooked as well. Anyway, okay, so to our soup, uh, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and add our broccoli over here to our, to our onions and garlic rice dish. And we'll put the lid on and just let that steam. And then to our soup, I added the rest of that water, um, but I'm going to be adding some more water. When you get done with that, you can fill that up with some more water. Um, and I'll go ahead and add my other, my other things for the soup. And I've got our, the seasonings here. We've got chili powder, cumin, onion powder, and black pepper. Oh, it's stuck in there. And we're gonna put in some tomatoes. And I've got these crushed fire roasted tomatoes. You can use just regular tomatoes. I prefer the crushed over the chunks.
but you can use whatever you've got, whatever you have, whatever you like. Just tomatoes in general are good. The fire roasted, of course, just adds that kind of smoky flavor, which is really nice. And I don't, I really am funny about tomatoes in cans. Because a lot of the tomatoes in the cans, I don't know if it's because my tastes are really keen or what, but, and I had a, I had a real fun time with the uh, can opener tonight. <laughs> so they, they kind of tore that apart. Um, but I find that tomatoes in a can often taste like the can. Does anybody else have that experience? So, so I found a really yummy tomato sauce in a jar. Natural Grocer sells them. It's a kind of a skinny jar, tall. They are so good. They're from Italy and they're a bit expensive, but I find them when they're on sale, I, I load up. Um, and they're just, anyway, I use those. But I find these actually don't taste like the can, at least when I try them. I don't try every can I use, but the brand is a natural grocer brand. So I need to be careful with that lid, whoever's taking out the garbage can. I should probably try them when I open a can. I should probably try them just to check and see if maybe I just got lucky that time. Okay, we're going to turn this down so it's not cooking so high. And then we're going to add our beans. Beans, beans, the magical fruit. The more you eat, the healthier you are. The more you eat them on a regular basis, the healthier you are. We don't want to, like, base our diet on beans. Although I probably could because I... I've always really liked them. I grew up, my favorite food as a kid was bean burritos and bean tostados. Yeah. Yes. I come from California. It was MJ's on cue. <laughs> I don't know what that meant, but they were, it was good stuff. Okay, and then we're going to do some, oh, by the way, my beans, those were beans that I cooked from scratch. And what I do is I soak them for about 24 hours, drain the water off, and that, the, they kind of get bubbly after 24 hours that water and you just dump that off and that helps with the gassy problem that often comes with beans. Although that problem is actually helping to build up your gut microbiome. Beans have a great fiber um, that feeds your gut bacteria. It's called resistant starch and it doesn't go through the normal di digestion prop pathway in your body. It goes into the large intestine undigested your gut bacteria feed on that fiber and break it down and they produce short chain fatty acids, which is very healthy for your gut. So I like to, um, yeah, I cook them from scratch. You can use the can, use canned beans. If you wanna use canned beans, that's great. But I find it super easy to cook them from scratch. I just cook them in a crock pot and for eight hours while I'm sleeping or eight hours while I'm, while I'm working, and they're done when I get home or when I get up, and it works out just, just great. Okay, I want to make sure I don't want that broccoli like the kale in the soup. I want the kale in the soup to be nice and tender. I, I want to keep the broccoli somewhat, you know, just have a little bit of texture to it still. I don't want it mushy. That could go just, that could get just a little bit more tender. Not too much though. Um, okay, and we got our rice, and we're gonna go with some, with some, tim um, with some, what's this called? A lemon. <laughs> we're gonna put that in our dish over here. So, well, we're done with the pear, right? So we're gonna pear, we're gonna cook that pear. That did a lot of pear. I didn't need, I didn't need that much pear, holy cow. Oh, well, we'll go ahead and cook it in all anyway. Oh, that was my broccoli. Maybe I'll keep that on. And at my, at my house, I have um, waterless cookware. And so I don't need to add any water to that. And I prefer not to because I want to keep this really sweet. And, but the last time I did it at this class and I used this pan, there wasn't much moisture, which I kind of want, but it still turned out really good. So we're just going to let that cook and see how it goes. I'm tempted to use, you know what, Jan, I'm tempted to use, um, 
I'm tempted to take out. Oh, you, did you do all four of those? No. Oh, three. I'm gonna I'm gonna take out some of that and use it for the salad instead of that other pear. Okay. Yeah. Because this is way too many pears for those were big pears. In fact, they're Bartlett pears. And but you can use any kind of pear you want. That's that's actually more than a cup, but we'll use that much anyway because we're not gonna need we're not gonna need that many pears. Although they do cook down a little bit, maybe I'll add a little bit more back. <laughs> okay. I just don't know. Uh huh. And the meal plan? Yes. The Oh yes. Okay. Does it? Well, and, and that's coming from, um, that's coming from, like, you're thinking, like, nutritarian, because he was, he was not very much into grains and, uh, grains, and I didn't eat grains really much at all for a long time, and I don't know for sure, but the food sensitivity thing comes from your gut, so somehow my gut, I mean, my gut feels good, but for some reason, I've got these food sensitivities, and it's a gut issue. And I can't help but to think that maybe part of that was because I wasn't eating the grains, because grains are really, actually, really good for you. I've learned that since. Which is kind of the opposite. It's not that they're not really good, but right, they have too many. right, right. And the proper ones. Right. Well, and you want to eat them whole intact is your best. I love tortilla chips. Eat, eat them if you can find some healthier ones. But it's, I mean, your grains, you want to get whole for, for your everyday, everyday stuff, you know. Natural Grocer, Harmon's. Actually, all the grocery stores have that. I don't know about all of them, but a lot of them. Most of them have it. It's, it's a very grainy, it's one of your healthiest, healthiest grains and, um, or one of your healthiest breads. It's, it's a sprouted grain bread and doesn't raise your blood sugar, it's just super healthy. And so that's just, that's the one I like. My husband says it tastes like cardboard, but I guess I like cardboard because I really like it. With some avocado on it, avocado toast on Ezekiel bread is really good. Love that. Oh, we don't want to cook that anymore. I'm going to go ahead and stir that rice into the broccoli because that's cooked a little bit too much. Go ahead and stir two cups of rice into that. Get it cooled down a little bit. We don't want that cooking anymore. And then I want to add um, some, I want to add some kind of seed or nut to this. And I'm going to add some pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds are a really great addition to your fall cooking. Pumpkin seeds are a great source of fiber, a great source of protein. They do have some omega-3 fatty acids. They're still high in omega-6 though, so we want to not overconsume them. The best way to eat nuts and seeds is mixed into your, into your meals because the fats increase the absorption of nutrients in um, the other foods that you're eating with it. So it's good to eat them with your meal rather than a handful while you're watching TV and you're mindlessly feeding your body or putting food in your mouth and you're not paying attention to how much you're eating, right? We've all been there. It's better than potato chips. That's so true. <laughs> Sometimes you just want, what? Need movie food. <laughs> Popcorn with uh, nutritional yeast is quite good, I've heard. I take pistachio instead of movies. Do ya? That's a good that's a good option for sure. Okay, we're gonna just go ahead and add that to our dish. And I just kind of rough chop them. I don't want them chopped up totally fine. In fact, you don't even need to chop them. They add some really nice flavor. And so this is how we want to add. Oh, we want to just take that off the burner. Turn it off. There we go. Um, what was I going to say? I was going to say something and now I can't remember what it was. Okay, we need, we need to add our butternut squash. So I'm just going to, this is probably, that's probably right about four cups, I'll bet. And I just, I just cook a squash and add it. You know, if it's a little more than four, I'll still add the whole thing in there. 
and that hot soup ought to cool down, um, or that squash ought to cool, help to kind of cool down this, cool down the, the soup. I'm going to go ahead and add some more water. Okay, so I cook my soups with not a lot of water, not a lot of broth, and then I add at the end because that way, when it's super steamy hot like this, I can add this cooler water and it'll kind of help to cool things down to where you don't have to wait a half hour to eat it because it's so hot. This is a beautiful soup as well, as you can see. The red and the green and the orange and the brown and the beans it just looks like fall, doesn't it? And you can keep this as thick as you want, thin it down as much as you want. I am going to add some, um, some salt. I, um, the tomatoes have a little bit of salt in them, but I'm going to go ahead and add uh, about a half a teaspoon. And you can add more. I'll have this out for you if you want to add some more to it. That's another thing that's different with Dr. Furman and do this Dr. Goldner that I'm finding. I, I mentioned to Karen that I was following Dr. Goldner's protocol right now. And um, she's like, we need salt. In fact, Pam Popper, she's another um, naturopathic doctor. She's like, we need salt. This no salt, you know, craze. I don't know how much of a craze it is. I mean, there's a certain kind of niche of people that follow it, but it's getting people in trouble. So it's not good. I know I cramp. My, my, my toes cramp and my legs cramp when I don't get enough salt. So, okay, then we are going to go ahead and add some lemon juice to this. You're going to put that cake out there in front of them, and uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's a Tuesday. <laughs> Um, yes, I believe so. You can probably chop the app, the apple, the other apple, not the pear though. We've got that taken care of. Yes. And then we're going to go ahead and add some salt to this. And you can try to just salt to taste. I'm going to go just a little bit more than a half a teaspoon there. How much lemon? It was um, a juice of a lemon. It was, it, there wasn't a ton of juice in it, so it wasn't super. I, I know normally lemon juice, lemons have about three tablespoons. It was probably a little bit less. I usually don't. I usually put it in and then taste and then add more if I need to. I should probably do it by the tablespoon so we more accurate. Okay, and that, that dish is done. And we're going to move over to the, let me check our soup, make sure it's still looking good and it's still steamy hot, so we're good there. All right, we're going to move over to our salad. We are just doing good on time and I like to keep it not too much longer than an hour. Don't want you guys to get bored. <laughs> oh, we got to do our salad dressing first. And we need some more lemon. So uh, for, for salad dressings, I like to do, um, I, I like vinegary dressings, vinegar based dressings. And when you buy vinegar dressings at the store, you look on your ingredient list to see what's in it. Thank you. Because you always do that when you buy things in a package. See what ingredients are in it. And you're going to find sugar and oil, usually. And I've got both of those right here in this bottle, soaking in some water. I've got hemp seeds or sunflower seeds you could use. You could also use cashews. They make a nice creamy, creamy sauce, creamy dressing. But I like to use hemp seed occasionally. Their omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acid profile is one-to-one, -one, which is what's recommended. Although, um, to re reduce inflammation, if you've got inflammatory issues, it's good to have more omega-3 fatty acids. So if you've got arthritis or things like that, you need to focus on more omega-3s and less omega-6. Um, so, but these kind of, this kind of cancels each other out. The omega-3s and the omega-6 fatty acids cancel each other out because they're equal. So um, anyway, so I've got those soaking along with some dates. I've got eight dates soaking in the water. 
so that we blend this up. It's going to be nice and creamy smooth. And what else do I have in there? Just dates and hump seeds and water. Since last night, um, they only need to soak for about for about like four hours is enough. Just going to rinse out that a little bit. They they are high in sugar, but we are um, we are blend. I know you were combining this with cabbage, and we're you know we're it's much much better than like um, you know your processed sugars. And if you need to add less, you can do that. Um, honey is kind of the same. Is kind of the same thing. You wanna, you want to. So are they? Are they calling? Are they calling for it because to not use sugar, or are they using it to as a flavoring, like to give a honey flavor? Because um, if they're, yeah, it, it's better to use the whole food, uh, like Chef AJ says, the whole food. Uh, what is her saying? Anyway, whole food and nothing but the whole food, or something like that. I can't remember what she says, sorry. <laughs> um, the, the fruit, the whole fruit, and nothing but the fruit, there we go, is best. So, trying to get that, there we go. Okay, so in, well, let's see, we still gotta, uh, we still gotta run that. over here. Oh, there it is right there. Okay, so there is our dressing. Oh, we I didn't put my seasonings in here and I've got um, that's for the pear. This is for the dressing. I've got some cinnamon. I think just cinnamon, right? Yeah. I think. Oh, yes. Cinnamon and nutmeg. Salad dressing. Yes. It's in there. <laughs> oh, and then the, the uh, rice vinegar, right? Three tablespoons of rice vinegar. Mix that in a little bit. And there we go. Okay, so to our salad, um, I've got cabbage. I've got two, uh, two and a half cups of green cabbage and one and a half cups of red cabbage and some shredded carrots. And then we're going to go ahead and add one apple that's been chopped with the Vidalia Chop Wizard, the small blade. And a, a, a cup of, or one pear chopped, about, which is about a cup. And then I'm, a, I'm going to put a little lemon juice over that, over that fruit. So they can keep it. The ju juice of a lemon, of a half a lemon, actually. Wasn't a half lemon? Yes, half lemon. All right, and then we're going to just stir that all around. I'm going to add some either currants, half cup of currants, raisins, or cranberries. And I really like using currants because they're tinier and they get dispersed better throughout the salad. You can use raisins. Dried cranberries are nice, especially this time of year. And this bowl is kind of small. <laughs> and we're going to add some uh, 
chopped pecans as well. I'm going to check my pears, make sure they're not burning. Oh, capers. I, I've used capers before in, I've got an Italian dish that I've put them in. I don't use them very much. I have some in my fridge. I just haven't used them for a while. You love them? Yes. Anything pickly I like. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this to a larger bowl. I don't know if it's a whole lot larger, but it's a little bit easier to. I had, I had a couple other glass ones. Oh, did you? That's all right. This will work. And we're going to add our pecans, chopped pecans. Um, pumpkin seeds are really nice in this salad as well. And then we'll go ahead and add our, um, our dressing. Yes. This salad wouldn't last real long because of the because of the dressing, adding the dressing to it, it'll last a couple days. I mean, cabbage is pretty hardy and it would hold up pretty good. So I was tempted to cut the recipe in half just because it made so much, but you guys can eat a lot, right? <laughs> we just want to give that a good stir. And maybe I'll have you stir that up real good, Jan, mm -hmm. and I'll attend to my pears. So like I said, when I have done these pears at home in my, in my waterless cookware, I usually have some, some juice boiling in the bottom. And what I do is I add some arrowroot powder, which I'm still going to do, and it helps to thicken. Have you guys ever used arrowroot? It's a thickening agent, kind of like cornstarch, but I prefer to use arrowroot rather than cornstarch. And so it will, it will thicken, but you got to be careful. You don't want to boil. You don't want to cook your arrowroot. You want to take it off your burner, which we'll do. I'm going to see. I think these, these pears have got to be nice and tender. Yeah. I'm tempted to add some water to that, but I don't think I will. We don't want to dilute the sweetness. So you want to take it off your burner and I'm going to go ahead and add my seasonings which is some teaspoon uh, which is some cinnamon and cardamom. And then arrowroot powder. Again this is more for if you've got some liquid but if you stir it in it'll it helps to thicken gravies or whatever it is you're adding to it but you want to take it off the burner. You don't want to boil the arrowroot because if you boil, unlike cornstarch, um, if you boil it, it won't, it won't work. Huh? Yeah. Have you ever heard of arrowroot? Yeah. Oh, okay. You don't want it to boil. Nope. Yeah, you want to bring your pears to a boil. And well, although they're not really boiling because there's no juice in here. <laughs> Does it? Yeah, so that's, that's like you want to bring the pears to a boil and then pull it off the, yeah, sorry, that maybe that was a little bit confusing. Yeah, that was just kind of a side note that you want to boil the pears, yeah. But like I said, you're not going to probably have much juice. When I did them in my cookware at home, I had a nice juice with that came off the pears. But this will just kind of add a thickening component to it, I think, and make it kind of more creamy, which it looks like it is. Okay. Yeah, instead of the frosting, we do the, we do the fruit. All right, you guys, I think we're set to have you come up and get some. Well, those craisins, but they're by, you need a table.